Welcome to AP European History with Dr. Borovkin. We continue today with the um, uh, 18th, uh, 19th century Europe, and the topic is a survey of new trends that is coming under the title Restoration, Liberalism, Romanticism, and Socialism. So we're going to deal with each of those new trends that appeared in Europe uh, after the Congress of Vienna, uh, and we're dealing with a period from 1815 to 1848, which would uh, shake it all up uh, in the revolutionary upheaval all over Europe, the revolution of 1848. So one more time, restoration, liberalism, romanticism, and socialism. So we start with restoration. What is restoration? Restoration is the order that was imposed in Europe at the Congress of Vienna. We talked about it already but just to refresh the most important facts. The, the key mastermind of this is Count Metternich, who is a chancellor of Austria. And so he, and together pretty much with Alexander I of Russia, they are the backbone of that kind of a desire to restore the old order. So this is kind of rolling back uh, the time, which is extremely difficult because Code Napoleon has been practiced for many, many years. Republics were established in Italy and in France, and it is extremely difficult, but that's, they, they still believe in divine right of kings. They do believe in the sanctity of their privileges. So it is genuinely a kind of a rollback to the old times before the French Revolution. It doesn't work completely, but nevertheless, it, they do reestablish Louis XVIII in France. The émigrés come back, and as you, you have seen in previous videos, they initiate the so-called white terror, uh, executing and catching and executing the Jacobins and all the people who had been uh, active in the French Revolution. So it is a definite restoration of the old order, but not completely. They cannot restore serfdom. They cannot restore ancient privileges of the landlords. So in many ways, things are unreversible. But still, they are pledged to restore the legitimacy as they mean it. Legitimacy means the rule of kings. The only order they think is legitimate is the one uh, of the kings, which is a totally different philosophy. The, the modern philosophy that produced by the French Revolution is that legitimacy comes from the people. And of course, the American Revolution, we the people, uh, that's the source of legitimacy. No, for these people, for Metternich, for Alexander, uh, and to some extent for the English kings, legitimacy is uh, the royal power. And that's what they impose on France, and they want to pledge to keep it that way all over Europe. So this is restoration. Now, in specific forms of organization, the uh, restoration is associated with the name the Holy Alliance, uh, and that is uh, at first the alliance of uh, Austria, Prussia, Russia, and England, but then England walks out in 1818 because it has other ideas and other agendas that would have to do with Mediterranean and fleet and industrialization and so forth. But uh, these, the other three remain for quite some time, most of the 19th century, Austria, Prussia, and Russia will be allies as guardians of the old order, uh, as of the conservative legitimate order. Uh, and this, would, this alliance would only crack up after Bismarck, uh, which in the 1880s, when France and Russia would start uh, you know, creating their own alliance that would be uh, up to World War I. So in any case, the Holy Alliance uh, is primarily that between uh, Russia and Austria. And the driving force be be between of this alliance is on Metternich for practical purposes. He's a realist. He's a, a diplomat. He's a very skillful politician. His purpose is to keep the old order because that guarantees Austria's domination of uh, Eastern and uh, Europe and, and, of course, of uh, most precious possession of Austria is northern Italy. Now, for Alexander, as I explained before, the most important thing is um, religious uh, um, kind of uh, forgiveness that he seeks for his possible participation in the murder of his uh, father, his guilty conscience, his religiosity, his spiritualism, his 
Mason sympathies. In other words, the guy has psychological problems and he seeks salvation in this kind of a holy alliance to preserve the old order. In any case, that's as far as restoration goes. Now, in practical terms, restoration is played out in France in, in most radical terms, in terms of Louis XVIII, who was replaced by Charles X, who is even more arrogant and more pushy and more restorationist, which would lead to a, a French Revolution of 1830, which is, of course, a, a separate big subject. But for this survey, what's important to say is that this is another revolution in France that there will be many. And this is the one that's most clearly associated with this wonderful picture by Delacroix of uh, Mar Marianne with a, a naked breast woman uh, charging with a French flag uh, uh, surrounded by other revolutionaries. That is from the uh, June days of 1830 in Paris. This revolution is a symbol of the final overthrow of the old order, at least in France. So this is about a restoration. Now, uh, let me talk about romanticism. Romanticism uh, is, uh, is an important uh, cultural, political, and uh, mental state. That's what I would refer to. It's, it, it's most vivid, of course, in the poetic movements, but I think it's much more than that. Uh, first of all, it is necessary to mention that this is the time of incredible flourishing of poetry in Europe, probably the best combination of uh, great poets all over Europe. I mean, just in England alone, you have Byron and Shelley and Keats and uh, um, Blake. I mean, these are each one of them is, is a magnificent. Uh, Robert Burns, all of them are just this incredible flowering of English poetry. But it goes at the same time in other places as well. Uh, this is also the time of Goethe. I mean, Goethe lives until 1830. So this is the German poetry, and it's also Russian poetry. Uh, Pushkin, the greatest Russian poet, uh, is, uh, is, is also in the same time. So all these poets are kind of united in this romantic movement. And let me explain in very briefly, uh, other than the history of literature, what it means for the history of intellectual history of Europe and cultural history of Europe. Romanticism could be defined as a protest against rationalism. So if the uh, end of the 18th century is the period of uh, age of reason, you know, the French elites are convinced that if, if everything is founded in reason, in the natural law, they're absolutely sure that there is such a thing as progress. They're absolutely sure in the perfectibility of society and of human nature by rational, reasonable policies. Now, all of that is gone. See, after the uh, uh, collapse of Napoleon's regime and restoration, all of this assuredness in the progress and in the uh, goodness of human nature uh, and of the capacity to improve it kind of disappears, uh, and, and, or at least is shaken up. Uh, and it is in that sense, you know, when we talk about uh, Faust and uh, Goethe uh, with his doubts and with his idea that everybody is kind of sinful and everybody at some point could make a deal with the devil. I mean, all these ideas are typical of the age of romanticism, which is not uh, like associated with romantic love. It does, but at the same time, it is doubt. It is doubt in the human nature and in the capacity to reform the society which inherently falls into, into wars, dictatorships. And, and the more glorious vision of Napoleon that we have now is not the one that people had at that time, because Napoleon is more associated at that time with a kind of a perversion of the French Revolution. And it's kind of a degeneration into a military dictatorship that devastated Europe with endless wars. And, and basically, it's like uh, hundreds of thousands of young men died for virtually for nothing, uh, for redrawing the borders that in the end went back to where they were. So there's a kind of a disillusionment in revolution. There's a doubt in progress, especially because of the German philosophy, which we skipped 
and didn't study as much, but it's also Immanuel Kant and his idea of hidden things and not knowing things and skepticism and, and a reversal. And then there is Hegel's philosophy of, uh, of kind of a spiral development and thesis, antithesis. Very, very complex philosophies begin to appear that, that are uh, at a much higher level of thinking than what the French philosophes did. Uh, all of that characterizes this period of romanticism, which is, uh, uh, you know, typical of that of that time uh, for for Europe. Now, and next to romanticism, uh, what we do have is uh, liberalism, which should be seen as resistance to the old order. So, in a sense, uh, a restoration goes together with liberalism, and. A restoration is old order, liberalism is new order. So liberalism is a revolutionary force at that time, which is trying to promote new ideas. And, and these are really new ideas. This is not the ideas of the French philosophes uh, that, that would be based so simple, so easy. You perfect society, you create new laws, everything would be wonderful. No, it's not like that at all. Liberalism is much more cautious. Uh, and it's, it's much more refined, and they are basically trying to do small steps of improvement. So instead of radical revolution change, liberalism is let's improve things a little bit. Uh, in class terms, what you could say if one were a Marxist is that liberalism is the ideology of the bourgeoisie. And by bourgeoisie we mean, in Marxist terms, the uh, the educated business elites that are beginning to play a more important role in these societies. It's it's not it's not only aristocracy, which is the major force in the French Revolution. No, it is city folks. That's what bourgeoisie is. It's it's educated city folks. It's it's not just notaries as in the French Revolution. It is entrepreneurs and craftsmen and. Uh, people who made the French Revolution of 1830. So they are liberals in a sense that they want liberty, but they also are more inclusive than the aristocracy was. So th they, they are more inclusive in terms of uh, who has a right to vote. Not everybody. They would not go for universal suffrage like the English Chartists wanted, but they are for people who are property owners, uh, who are educated, and who basically want a liberal order, which means more inclusive, more democratic, but not complete democracy. So the kind of a ideology of well-to-do uh, businessmen and uh, educated society. These are the liberals. Now, they are also, at the same time, most of these people are nationalists. And uh, not in today's term, because today the word nationalism is a bad one, but in terms of patriots. So these go together. Most people who are liberals in 1820s and 30s will be also uh, nationalists or patriots. And, and that would be people like Mazzini in, uh, in young Italy. And that would be um, uh, leaders of the uh, French Revolution of 1830. So these are... Uh, these are uh, liberals and patriots at the same time. Now, patriots means they want their patrie, they want their nation. And as I mentioned before, uh, one of the greatest symbols of this age is everybody wants to have a grand nation. In other words, the inspiration of the French Revolution is so powerful that now everyone, I mean, not everyone, but most countries begin to think about their nationhood. Uh, in those countries where this is established, you know, such as France and, and Spain and England, that, that's not an issue, and social issue would come to the fore much more. But in those countries, they don't have it. This becomes number one priority. And that, of course, first and foremost for Italy. Uh, this is where Italian uh, nation is waking up. Uh, it is tired of being divided by its foreigners. Uh, from the times of the Re Renaissance. And there's a powerful new movement that is gaining steam, a young Italy, which is led by Mazzini, which will win, uh, but it will take it another 40 years until 1860s to actually create unified Italy. It is also very powerful in Germany, uh, but Germany, as I said before, is, is still, it, it is one cultural place. 
uh, and it's going to be step by step to unify it politically and economically. And that would be a, a, a story for us to see in the 19th century, primarily because of the stumbling block, uh, and that is the rivalry between Austria and Prussia as to who is going to lead Germany. And then finally, uh, in this chapter of national movements, we have seen heroic struggle of Greek people for independence, which did succeed. Uh, and there were gruesome moments of massacre, especially in the island of Chioto, I think, in uh, uh, 1824, when there were Christians massacred by the Turks. And, and that became big news. And Byron publicized it. And this became you know, one of the reasons why Russia and uh, um, Britain uh, were allies together to, to, to secure independence for Greece. But not only that, th this, of course, meant Poland, uh, that they do remember, the Poles did, that the, the they had their statehood in the 18th century, and that they had at least the uh, Grand Duchy of Warsaw under Napoleon, and now they don't have anything. They are divided up, and the biggest part goes to Russia. So they keep up about their nation. They are liberals, and they are patriots, and they are romantics, all of the three. And, and they have uh, one of the great musicians, Chopin, uh, Chopin, uh, who goes to Paris and plays this wonderful music and becomes a Polish patriot. The Poles won't have their nation, too. La Grande Nation of their own. And they fight the Russians, but they're not going to get it until uh, 100 years later. Uh, uh, 1918. So also the same thing could be said about those other places that would fight for their independence, such as Ireland, uh, who would not get it for a very long time, again, only until after World War I. So we can divide this kind of period, uh, it, 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 we can divide these countries that do succeed and do, do not, but they are all driven by this uh, movement of liberalism and uh, patriotism. Finally, let me say a few words about uh, socialism. Uh, socialism uh, is a big topic. We'll come back many times to it later on. But for this age, for the 30s and 40s, the most important element in socialism is, of course, the Chartist movement. Uh, and that is a spectacularly interesting movement because, uh, as we have heard, uh, the Chartists outlined the program of social and political change that would take years and years and years to uh, implement. But they were the first ones to actually demand in Britain universal suffrage. Uh, they were the first ones to actually demand democracy, which proves that the working class movement was profoundly democratic rather than subversive, as the ruling elites tried to uh, portray they wanted to have annual parliament. They wanted to have a, uh, a universal suffrage elections. They wanted to have an eight-hour day. A hundred years before it was actually implemented, uh, they wanted to have an equal pay. They wanted to have social services, which Bismarck would be the first ones to implement. Uh, insurance and unemployment and all kinds of other services that the English workers would fight for decades and decades and decades before they will be able to get it. Don't forget, in England of that time, trade unions were illegal. Uh, people were pretty much harassed by the bourgeoisie, which led Karl Marx to speak about dictatorship of the bourgeoisie in England. So from that point of view, the Chartist movement is the uh, banner of things to come as an indication of a much, much more powerful movement that's going to shake up Europe to its very core. Uh, and that's the movement of socialists and later on communists that first will come out in 1848 with Karl Marx publishing his Communist Manifesto and shaking up the world and Europe. And on that note, my dear boys and girls, subscribe to Dr. Brodkin, AP European History.